Good day. This uh, my name is Jose Costa, and I would like to present here a very brief synopsis of what comparative and international education is. I have a PhD in comparative and international education from Loyola University of Chicago, and I have um, you know many times encountered people who ask me what is comparative and international education. So I thought presenting a brief synopsis of what this field is. Uh, might help those who are interested in pursuing comparative and international education. Now, there, we have to look at the actual name, comparative and international education. Some people call it international comparative education. Uh, so those are two perhaps most common variations of this name, where you place, place comparison, comparative, and where you place international. Perhaps that shows the emphasis in which the program places uh, in terms of its school of thought and its agenda and so forth. Uh, in my um, experience, I have often used the word compare the words ordered this way: comparative and international education. Many times, people don't put much, uh, pay much attention to this, but I think it's essential that we do. Uh, so, thinking in terms of what this whole name means is a merging of two uh, very broad areas. One is comparative education and the other is international education. Uh, a lot of schools have international education separated from uh, any other aspect of education and other places have had comparative education. And lately, there's a much more, it's much more common to find international education over finding comparative education per se uh, uh, on the other hand we when we find comparative education we find it always or often combined with international education and um, therefore called comparative and international education so two concepts two fields that merge comparative education and international education comparative education we have to uh, when we think in comparative education, we have to think of the very concept of comparison. Uh, and questions that would arise in this sort of a field are really aspects of what are legitimate comparisons. Uh, how can these comparisons help us to advance the cause of our of a very purpose of our program, and and so on. International education, on the other hand, has to do exactly with that, the international, it is between nations. So we would need, this kind of education happens to be interested in across the nation programs, across the nation endeavors, across the nation efforts. And uh, so combined, comparative and international education, whenever we would have to engage in this sort of a field, we have to master both the comparison part and the international part. Uh, the, what happens often is that people who are international education experts uh, end up calling themselves a part of comparative and international education, and, and comparativists also would call themselves, you know, part of international education. But I think we need to be careful to reflect very carefully about this. And if we want to call ourselves uh, people engaged in the field of comparative and international education, we need to carefully master the comparison part as well as master the international part. Now, comparisons can happen anywhere. They happen in any field. Uh, various studies in education are comparative. Uh, they establish comparisons, and uh, various studies uh, across the so sociology, uh, history, or political science, they call themselves comparative. And so what would need to be uh, make a distinction as far as the comparative nature of comparative education versus the comparative nature of other fields is that we need to essentially um, look at what, how can we justify what we are calling comparative in our field of comparative education and why is that important? Again, legitimacy, establishing the legitimacy of comparisons becomes critical because we can make comparisons of apples and oranges. Uh, and we, we can also 
you know, make comparisons of apples with apples. And at times, people, because of at, at face value, they can make the judgment that apples with apples is a much more legitimate comparison. Perhaps it is closer to legitimacy, but it is—is is it really? A legitimate comparison we have to ask ourselves what makes it legitimate comparison could do we need to have apples of the same tree in order to be even closer to comparison or do we look across the field of you know and see what apples look a bit more similar than others and those that look similar have similar characteristics then could be better com comparable um, those are questions that as a comparative education expert we have to ask ourselves when we engage in comparisons of any sort um, and in the international aspect we and then we have the international aspect which is we do comparisons yes there are comparisons that happen in that happen within a, a border of a nation or a country and we often find the arguments of those are not part of comparative and international education because they really not are not international. Well, they they are not international, and that's the distinction between ideographic and and nomothetic studies and so on. But we we can make a, a case for this in the sense that nation doesn't necessarily confine itself. The concept nation doesn't necessarily confine itself with the concept nation that we have seen it with nation states. We have several nations within one border. For instance, in if I talk about my own context of Mozambique, we have the Shangan nation, the, uh, the Ronga nation within the borders of the, the Maputo, which is the capital uh, province. But within the country itself, we have several nationalities and several nations. But obviously, all these things have become very diffuse and very complicated with colonialism and the borders have been tracked. But as an ideographic scholar, I can make a case for these comparisons between the nations that, that we know, the ethnic groups, the ethnicities, uh, and cultural groups that exist within borders, the same border, as being a part of comparative and international education. Um, the other aspect we need to, to understand is that comparative and international education is the application of theories and methods to this, uh, th that come from the social sciences. Now, what that implies is that we need to be well-versed with theories and methods. So we need to have very good theoretical and methodological foundation in order to be able to apply those theories and those methods. Uh, you know, so unless we have that foundation, then our studies become very, sh you know, they become short of real good comparative education, comparative and international education studies. And the other foundation we need to have is the philosophical foundation in which we get well grounded in epistemology, uh, looking at what, you know, positivistic perspectives and relativistic perspectives and postmodern perspectives and so on and so on within the field of comparative education, within the literature of comparative education, within the various schools of comparative education. But unless we have a well-grounded epistemological understanding, it becomes very difficult for us to engage in this field because it, it then we get confused and we we might become very shallow as practitioners of comparative and international education. The, the, the next aspect, which is tied to the fact of the split of the two, comparative and international, is the conceptual uh, grounding. We need to be well, uh, well versed in com conceptual analysis because there's a lot of uh, new concepts emerging and old concepts that have been used in various ways by various people. And when, whenever we apply a particular concept in a study, we need to be well, uh, we need to frame it very well in order for the reader to understand what exactly we're talking about. So if we're talking about uh, comparing uh, school systems, we need to exactly explain what that's, what it means. First of all, to be making this comparison and second of all, to be uh, making the, you know, what, what it means, what we mean by school systems. Uh, and so grounding in several aspects, theoretical, theoretical, 
and methodological aspects and in philosophical aspects as well as in conceptual aspects becomes then a part of this introduction uh, and, uh, and of establishing foundations for to become a good student, a good uh, practitioner, a uh, good researcher in comparative and international education. And these are very, I believe, very critical. And I think every good comparative and international education introductory course should be addressing theories and methods, should be addressing philosophy, should be addressing concepts and con or conceptual analysis or critical thinking about concepts so that when we apply all of these we apply them with a deeper understanding a uh, better picture have a better picture of how then we can engage in uh, in a much more useful activity within the field as students and researchers and professors thank you